The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, evening, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here, uh, emceeing this evening's presentation. Let's put it that way. Uh, our special guest is uh, Anthony Clark, Small Talk Daily on the Twitters. So we're doing it a bit different this evening. Rather than Ant Anthony standing up and doing us a PowerPoint and everything, we thought, hang on a sec. Anthony's got a bunch to say. I got a bunch of questions. You've got a bunch of questions. So let's do some Q&A. Let's touch on 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 particular stocks and sectors which Anthony's got a, a, a special knowledge in, in a sense. Anthony, really appreciate the time this evening. I suppose the place to kick off, which is that it has been a year for, for small and mid-cap. I mean, you, you just tweeted some numbers a moment ago, uh, and, and it really has been a, a stellar year for the sector, and well outperforming the boring mining, banking, big caps. Yeah, hi, Simon. It's really good to be with, uh, with you here, and to all of us listening on. I hope in the next hour you will uh, learn uh, a little bit about what's going on in the small to mid-cap sector. Um, you're correct. As of uh, when I, when the market closed, the small cap sector year to date uh, is up 41.8%. The mid-cap sector is up 20.1%. The JSE Aussie sector is up 9.3%. The top 40 is up 7.4%. And in the same period, the rand versus the dollar is 1% stronger. So, you know, you know the Aussie 40 and the Orsha are dominated by the big dual listed, British American tobacco, South African breweries, NASPERS, Process, yeah. and they haven't really done that well as, as, as an asset class. So they've dragged down the, the major indices, despite the commodity sector doing extremely well. But the small cap sector, from a, a really bombed out situation, uh, at the height of a COVID sell-off in March 2020, when stocks that I've been covering for 20 years, you could have bought on PEs of twos and threes, and in many cases, next to zero, given the cash holding they had in the asset base. They've had a resounding, stonking run, uh, but I still think there's far more in it because many counters are still trading on PEs of threes, fours, and fives because the underlying earnings recovery and the prospects in some counters remain excessively strong. And, and many of these stocks, I mean, and let's touch on combined motor holdings. Results out this week. I chatted with, with Jeb McIntosh this morning. I, I, and, yeah, it's, it's a stock that yeah, it's always been a, a well-run business. They almost, in a sense, they've come out of this a, an even better business. I mean, they're ahead of where they were in 2019, notwithstanding the inability to, to get stock because of the, the, the silicon chip shortage, which is hindering supplies. Renault reporting that they're going to produce 8% less vehicles this year. Yeah, I must say, CMH is a truly amazing business. Again, as basic background for listeners, this business was founded by two partners back in the early 70s. And the CEO of the company, Jeb McIntosh, is probably now 74, 75, and he's still running the business. You've never come across a guy who's more in touch with his business and look at the price of the nut and bolt is, as well as the brand new Lexus. He really is on top of his game. And I like investing in owner-managed, uh, you know, uh, driven companies. They, they know about costs. They know how to understand the marketplace, and more importantly, they know what the customer wants. And as you correctly said, in recent interim results to August, uh, they came in with HEPs down 14%. But saying that, this is a company uh, that you could have bought at the height of the pandemic last year at 10 Rand 26. Uh, the last price I saw was about 26 Rand. And they sit with about 9 Rand a share in cash. Now, the really interesting thing about this company, aside from the fact that they have a nationwide footprint across Nissan, Ford, Land Rover, Suzuki, amongst other things, is they have a, 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 a service and parts business, which is doing quite well. But what most people forget, you know, the last two years, this country has been in lockdown. We haven't traveled. People yeah. haven't flown into this country from overseas. And the car rental market was absolutely nailed to the floor. Now, what Jeb McIntosh and his team at CMH did when the pandemic hit, they went in with a knife and they cut costs. They sold off a large part of the fleet. They retrenched off to really nailed down the cost base of that business to make it now a very lean, mean, efficient business. Not much more fat can be trimmed. You've seen in the last few weeks, the UK has lifted travel restrictions. The Germans have, the Dutch have. I spoke to a car rental company this morning, uh, basically who said to me, he said, if you haven't booked a car now for December, good luck. Rates are up 30%. The fleets are a lot smaller. So those with cars in a fleet, which have got great connections to airlines and a nationwide footprint, will do extremely well. And the likes of, an, of, a, of a Europe car, an Avis, a budget, some of the smaller ones, have basically defleeted too aggressively. First car rental owned by Combined Motor Holdings, 
has got about five and a half thousand cars, great setup, oh, wow. okay. and they're doing extremely well. And I think they're going to have a fantastic run uh, in the festive period up until Easter. And that combined with an eventual pickup of new car sales when chips start to come online means that CMH to me remains an astonishingly good stock to own. And, and they've got, if I remember correctly, they've got the the, the deal, the, 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 the car rental with uh, Flas who's with the air, they're the airline who's doing the most flying around South Africa at the same time. Yes, and the most reliable. I, I travel quite a bit, and uh, I must say, with, uh, with with SAA now coming online, uh, and British Airways and Safair, Safair had the most flights yeah. uh, with the most consistency. And at the end of the day, they've picked up nice market share and because of that link with Safair. Combined with a market improved the unproven share of uh, of car rental. They said they've probably got about 30% market share. I mean, used to be a second line player. They're now a top tier player, and that means that when the market really picks up again and the tourists start coming back and you value start coming back to Cape Town on holiday, you'll have to spend a lot more renting your car, and that will go right into the back pocket of CMH. No, I'm in Cape Town next week, but I'm doing it the old-fashioned way. Uber to the v and and then I'll walk everywhere and Uber everywhere. But certainly demand is there. And if we look at I mean, is it a, a – Motus is, is the other one. Obviously, the spin-out from Imperial. And, and, I mean, good results for them as well. They've also got a, a, a car rental. When I compared the most recent combined motor against Motus, <clears throat> excuse me, to me it was – I mean, combined it comes out the better stock. Yeah, it's chalk and cheese. In terms of actual numbers, Motors is like a 90 billion rand revenue business, and CMH's brand number is 10 billion rand. It's a much smaller business. But at the end of the day, I want to be in a company which is nimbler and has much leaner costs. And the other interesting little thing is about timing of results. CMH is an August interim period, which mm -hmm. means that the Urban and Gauteng riots were in their base. In Imperials, sorry, in Motus's case, they'll always be uh, Imperials for me. In Motus's case, uh, their numbers, if they're a June uh, year end, which means their second half will account in July for the riots. So when the results are released in early 2022, they will have to account for the riots, uh, which CMH has gone past. So I think it's on a timing issue as well, I've had a long CMH short Motus for the best part of this year. And I think from memory, combined motor holdings on a relative basis is up 63% and motors is up about 16%. So if you were a hedge fund, you would have made money hands down being long CMH and short motors. Even though motors has done exceptionally well, CMH has done even better. Yeah, they've done even better. So the stock that is getting all the questions, and we were actually talking about it before we came on air. I had a couple of phone calls about it today. Uh, I actually spoke to the CEO early in the week about their, their, their sort of getting uh, helium into an exchangeable product. We'll touch on that in a sec. Renogen. I mean, they, I mean, Renogen is. I, I remember when they listed as a as a SPAC. Uh, they, they they bought that asset in the free state. They were looking for natural gas. That was what they were all excited about. Um, and they came back and it turned out, yeah, they've got some natural gas. But what they've really, really got is truthfully some of the world's best helium deposit literally on planet Earth. Yeah, again, as background to the listeners who may not know the full story, Renogen basically listed, I think, in about 2015 and spent many years um, sort of developing the gas fields in the free states just outside Velcom where they had about 188,000 hectares of land under uh, license for development. Now, interestingly, gas was discovered in that region in the 1950s and 1960s, when South Africa was, was run by coal. We didn't need gas. <laughs> you know, we're now in 2021, 2022, when clean and green and ESG is a, is a much more prevalent topic for investors. And they want you know, a lower carbon footprint uh, uh, energy source. So what has basically happened with Renogen after many years of being a speculative uh, exploration company? Um, in early 2021, they started becoming what I, what I saw as a commercial proposition. Yeah. So in January the 14th, I came out with a wildcard buying the stock at 12 Rand because I truly believed that this would be Renogen's year. When a lot of the work in terms of developing the reserves, drilling the wells and proving that there is something in the ground would all come to fruition. The share price of that chart shows you there ran from about 12 rand to just over 31 rand. It came all the way back um, as, uh, as the go-go stocks in the JSC lost a bit of a bit of a helium, should we say, light, light air, and it bounced again at 1540. Now, why did that turn, as you see there, about two months ago actually occur? The answer is very simple. Renjen is driven by news flow, 
And as the company starts releasing updates regarding the underlying development and quantum of gas in its operation, the percentage of helium, for example, in the underlying uh, gas that's given off, which ranges between two and four percent, which is basically 10 to 20 times greater than the world's largest producers in Australia, sorry, in America, Qatar, Russia, and Algeria. It means the underlying payback on this, on this reserve starts to become quite material. So some basic numbers for you. There's two phases here. There's Virginia phase one, which mm -hmm. is a smaller one, which should turn the taps in December, January. On a daily basis, that'll produce 350 kilograms of helium and 55 tons of liquid natural gas. They've recently signed a deal with Console Glass to supply 14 tons a day, clean manufacturing will come. When Virginia phase two comes on stream at the end of 2024, and that'll be a very large capital commitment, up to 10 billion rand, they will produce five tons of helium a day and between 750 and 800 tons of liquid natural gas a day. So on a basic back of an envelope numbers, and these are all very, it's all very, you know, it is basically supposition based yeah. on now prices for helium and liquid natural gas. In theory, in 2025, if we reach full production, we're looking at a company that in theory, on a back of an envelope, could produce EBITDA numbers of near 2.9 billion rand, which is the equivalent of a current market cap. That is if everything goes right, everything happens on track, but you have to spend up to 10 billion rand to get there. So the payback in theory literally would be three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So what happened in the last week is they launched the Helium token, which yeah. you alluded to earlier, which basically allows them to raise money in US dollars. So if you buy Helium token as, a, as an individual or a company that uses Helium in, you know, in, in any number of industries, you have a right to get either physical delivery or like Bitcoin or Ethereum, you can trade it. Mm -hmm. So what this does is it gives a daily value and a, and, a, and a traceability and a tradability to a commodity which is currently very difficult to value. So the, the rough average price of helium is about 45 US dollars a, a kilogram. So it's, it's immensely valuable. So you can start doing the basic numbers. If you produce 350 uh, kilograms a day times $45 a kilogram, the numbers start ratcheting up. And the same for liquid natural gas. That trades at about 230 uh, rand a gigajoule. Uh, so the numbers start to, to become quite material. So I'm forecasting for Virginia phase one in 2022, if everything goes to plan, they will have revenue of 320 million rand. And that's the first phase based on a very limited amount of production. Phase two, you basically get 10 or 20 times the size of business. So it's, it's got a lot of interesting potential. There's still risk there because you have to fund this. Uh, but what I'm saying is there's potential there. The days of this business being, well, it's maybe there. Let's mm -hmm. sniff for it. It's now, it is there. We want to know how much is there. And that's going to be the next scenario for energy. And, and that token that they've launched, I mean, I remember when Brian Gilbertson uh, uh, at BHP sort of took uh, iron ore and started to make it traded on, on spot market, fundamentally changed the mechanics. There was always quarterly contracts done in dark rooms in China and the like. And if we go even further back when, when oil started to be traded free, I mean, if it works, it, it can fundamentally shift that market. The, the, the big point is 10 billion to, to get to, to, to phase two. That su su suggests to me that at some point they're going to need to do some level of a, of a capital raise. Yeah, the, what the token actually did in a very elegant move, and I wrote this in a note uh, when the deal was announced, is it actually changes the funding dynamics for energy. One of the biggest concerns the market had uh, up until the token was announced was at some stage to fund Virginia phase two, there needs to be a massive equity raise or ongoing equity raises and or debt. Mm -hmm. What the helium token allows them to do is that 65% of the helium they are going to produce from phase two has already been contracted to major global players like Linde, Mesa, amongst others. These are very well-known companies which have agreed to take a certain proportion of the offtake. 35% of their production can be traded on the spot market. Now, if I were to think logically, they have raised $25 million issuing 100,000 tokens, which gives you a right to a certain amount of helium. Now, if you take it to the ultimate aim, which is a big hypothetical jump here, sure. but I'm just giving you an example. 
If they were to tokenize the remaining 35% of the helium that they intend to produce, in theory, they could raise a billion dollars, which would more than fund the entire Virginia tour. It's not going to happen. They're not going to issue tokens to the, until the end of time. But what it does give you is a, another mechanism to raise money aside from an equity raise and debt. The token issue could actually raise you know, substantial amounts of money to help fund the development. So it's de-risked the project and it's reduced the risk level of major dilution coming in earnings because there are now, there are now other fungible forms of, of, of equity and debt and tokens to raise the money to fund this operation. Yeah, and that gives Steph and his team, as you, as you point out, it gives them an extra option there of, of raising. So maybe there's a rights issue. It can be markedly smaller, less debt, and then, of course, that that, that token going through. Let's touch on one of the stocks, uh, some news out uh, today. Uh, you, you were tweeting about it earlier this morning. Omnia, uh, they're selling off one of their, their assets. We, we're seeing this from, 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 from a lot of stocks. And Omnia and Invicta, and those are but both two companies that you that, that you cover, they've actually both been really good turnaround stories over the last uh, two to three years. Uh, you know, rights issues in some of the cases and, and the like, but 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 they've they've done that turnaround. And the Omnia, as I see it, it's really them kind of cleaning up their portfolio and, and getting them back back into a, a leaner and, and and better space for them to be. Yes, again, as basic background, I've covered Omnia for over 20 years. It's basically a, an agricultural fertilizer, uh, mining explosives, and speciality chemicals business. And back in the heyday, the stock was trading, I think, at about 160 rand. And through a combination of calamities and poor trading and, and operational issues and too much debt, the company's share price crashed uh, to, to a point where they had to have an emergency rights issue to raise 2 billion rand at 20 rand a share and the market punished them extremely badly. Um, about two years ago, um, that rights issue happened, and the, the market literally, uh, you couldn't touch uh, on yeah. the nobody wanted to know. The new CEO came in, um, uh, Selim Gobani. He has fundamentally transformed that business by taking it back to its roots, which is, as I said, fertilizer, mining explosives, speciality chemicals. Anything that really didn't fit the mold has been disposed of, or there's been a cheeky offer to buy a part of the empire, at a great price, he has decided to sell. So literally about six months ago, um, Omnia sold their uh, agricultural nutrients business called Oro Agri uh, to an international player for 2.4 billion rand, which is more than double what they paid for it three years ago. So at one foul swoop, um, they got in a huge chunk of cash, they paid them the remaining debt, and to reward shareholders for supporting them at 20 rand, they gave you a two rand final dividend and a four rand special dividend, giving back a billion rand to shareholders. And they're still sitting with net cash of a billion rand. Now, what today's transaction of the sale of Umongo Petroleum does is they bought Umongo in May 2017. And it's basically a specialist oils and lubricants business. It's part of the old Chevron uh, 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 business okay. from many, many years ago, which is now Engine. So it seemed like a very odd transaction. Why would an agricultural and fertilizer and mining business suddenly buy a speciality lubricants and oil business? But back in the day, they did it. That went, thankfully, has now gone. They've been kicked into touch. And uh, it was clear in my mind that when a cautionary was issued uh, by Omni on the 30th of September, that the first thing that I said was going to be offloaded was Umongo. It's, it's, it just looked like a pig in a poke. It, it just didn't fit in the portfolio. And as we saw today in the sense, they have basically sold it uh, to a Belgian-based uh, specialty chemicals company for the equivalent of one company the same. And, uh, you know, they didn't give too much away. But when you cover a company for as long as I have, you can read between the lines and, and pick up, uh, you know, the, the nuances. And as I treat it today and publish in a three-page note, I would not be surprised if it's in the fullness of time, given they have a fantastic uh, cash flow uh, position and, and great working capital management. They've got net cash in the balance sheet, another billion grants coming in. Yeah. I would have a side bet with you right now, but at some point in the next six months, a special dividend is going to come again. And I think you've got a trading update forthcoming in the middle of November. The second half is always better because of the agricultural season. The agricultural sector in this country is absolutely flying currently because of very strong international soft commodity prices. Mining is recovering after COVID, and Omnia is right slap bang in the middle of a fertilizer boom, a mining boom, and now cash in the bank. 
And I think even at 63 Rand, what it was today, I have a target price of 80 Rand. And I first recommended this stock back in July 2020 at 27 Rand 30. So it's nearly tripled, but it still has legs. Yep. It's amazing what just cleaning up the house and a new CEO can do. Yeah, and, and the folks who went for the rights issue, that special dividend, they've given the money back. But you make an interesting point there, Anthony, which is I, you've been in this game for, 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 for more than a three or four years, and you, you cover the stocks. And what you don't do is that when a stock sort of loses its way, you don't sort of back off and ignore it. You continue it. It might not be a buy. It might be a sell. But it gives you that 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 depth of knowledge of, of, of a company, which, which is, as an investor, immensely invaluable. So you don't have to come back to Omnia and catch up with the last six years, for example. Yeah, you make a very valid point there. And I think uh, anyone listening to this, I think I tell people to read as much as You know, I've been in the small sector now for, in this country, the best part of 27 years. And I've been covering equity markets for the best part of 40 years. So I'm older than I look. It's amazing what good lighting does on a webinar. <laughs> uh, and it's that longevity of covering the stocks that gives you that depth of history and knowledge to ride the waves. So back when Omni was completely beaten up, you, you know, many analysts would have just said, you know what, this thing has fallen in a heap, yeah. why should I bother? But if you understand the drivers that actually move companies and the sectors, you stick with things. So in many cases, I've covered companies since IPO or since I first moved to this country in, in May 1996. So as an example, I've covered Boulder Metcalf for 27 years, cash built 27 years, Afrimat since it's listed in 2006. Pioneer Foods, I listed in 2008 when it was sold to Pepsi. I still cover it. Zeta since 2006. It's that longevity that gives you the understanding of the business, despite as that chart shows you there. You know, the calamitous rise and then slump in the share price. You stick with the story because if a narrative changes and sentiment changes, you can make a great deal of money if you know the background history. So that chart you're putting up there, that Omnia chart, look at the bottom, 20 Rand. Yeah. At 20 Rand, you couldn't give it away. Yeah. But if you'd supported the rights issue, you would, have, you would have made three times your money in a year and a half. An even better story is, is Invicta. If you put up the Invicta yeah. charts, that's, that's, even, that's, that's like your wildest lottery dream. Yeah, Invicta, uh, Stephen Joffe has done the, 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 the turnaround there and another one. And they also just did an acquisition, was it just, uh, uh, I think it was last week, the week before. Um, again, they, they've got their balance sheet working and they've gone out and, 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 and done an acquisition. And it's been uh, uh, an immense recovery. And you know, folks look at that 130 and think, oh, but no, ignore that. That's the past. It's, it's what is their future? And it, it's looking significantly brighter these days. Yeah, again, as, as basic background, um, during the, the sell-off of COVID-19, when Invicta was mired in debt, it had a huge uh, debt pile and a 750 million rand uh, uh, SARS tax claim against oh, it. That's right. And yeah. there was a change in, in management. This stock got down to four rand and seven cents. I issued a buy in the stock uh, in April 2020 at six rand, and I came out with a bold price target of 20 rand. And people thought I was, I was on crack. Uh, and I said, why are you, are you so bold with your price targets? And my answer was very simple. Invicta is basically supplying the nuts and bolts and spare parts of the industry going. If there's no Invicta or Hudeco, where are you going to get all the nuts and bolts, the filters, the spare parts, the belts, the economy going? There will be 37 grand a share. So whilst their balance sheet was to hell in the hand cart, the underlying business potential if you find job basically uh, transform the company it's been like the phoenix running rising from the ashes and it's gone from six rand at its lowest point during covid it's now at 30 rand and as you correctly said last week he's bought a fantastic new business for 567 million rand in telecommunications technology and power management systems called darkcom it's a, it's a sizable business. I actually spoke to the, uh, the chairman, uh, Kudasana Pitsi, and, and the CEO, Brett Nash, last week, who have an impeccable track record in running technology companies. And uh, I would urge everyone on this webinar to actually um, Google Kudasana Pitsi and the background that this gentleman has actually come from and his very humble, humble beginnings in, uh, in Mamelodi and, and Shoshenguve and the empire he's now built in a respectable fashion. This year, Dotcom will deliver 2 billion rand in revenue and probably profits of about 100, 
100 to 120 million rand. So this transaction, which Invicta has done, basically will pay for itself in about four years. It's a new growth silo, a new leg, and despite the run in Invicta, I see much more legs to come in the stock. And again, it's a September interim result. The trading update will come out probably in early November, mm -hmm. and I'm expecting this company to show very good earnings growth for the next few years. As I love using the term, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, no, I agreed. A uh, quick question coming through, folks asking for a recording. We indeed are. Uh, an interesting question, Anthony. How do you choose the stocks? I mean, you, 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 you specialize sort of in the, the agri and the small mid-cap space, but there's a lot of stocks out there which, which you simply don't cover. Uh, and, and partly that's, I imagine, just you know, hours in the day. But how do you decide, yep, I'm going to cover that one, not that one? A lot of it is, is just, I have a very broad knowledge of, of a domestic marketplace, and there are certain sec sectors that cover close to other. Again, uh, just as, as background, when you cover you know, a wide sphere of industry, you get to know lots of people, and you get to read, read a combination of interests. So, for example, yesterday, I put on my Twitter page, my work yesterday involved telecommunications, poultry, car rental, uh, soft commodities, and uh, fast food. It's 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 a strangest combination of companies. But when you when you cover small to mid caps, you have to be a jack of all trades. Mm. It doesn't mean that I'm a, a master of none. It just means that you have to have a much broader understanding of the economy and how companies tick than an analyst, for example, that only focuses on one sector. So in my case, if I look at a company, I think what's the driver for this company's growth? What's the catalyst that if a new story, a change of sentiment a, poss a possible transaction, uh, a possible de uh, demerger. Uh, what could possibly change that could fundamentally change the market's view on the valuation of this company? And it's that grain of, of, of an idea that starts. I work in what's called a mosaic theory, where you get tiny bits of information and you knit them all together and eventually you make a piece of cloth. From that piece of cloth, which can take months or years, you then cut a story. So part of the, uh, the the, the raison d'etre of being a small cap analyst is you have to sometimes work on stories for years until they actually come to fruition. And for example, in the agricultural space, I've covered certain companies for eight or 10 years where the story still hasn't unfolded, but it probably will in the next year or two. And you have all that background wealth behind you. So if the story eventually hits and the stock lists on the stock exchange, you've got the background story. So in the small to mid cap space, you literally need to have uh, longevity and the ability to track companies for sometimes decades to understand what goes on and suddenly something happens and the thing takes off. Renogen is a classic case. I covered yeah. that stock for five years. For five years I did nothing and in December 2020 uh, one called the CEO and a, and a, and a quick question on, on, a, on, a, on a belief that I had but it was moving from a speculative phase to the commercial development phase changed my viewpoint on the company and its risk profile to investors and the 12 rand of the stock literally was a stealing buy. The rest is history. Yeah. It's, it's all about a, a, ch a change in narrative. Yeah, and as you say, and, and that, that that experience, that 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 time, sort of, you know, in, in the process, in a sense, so you can identify it and recognize the importance of it. You mentioned Afrimat Andres van Heerden. I I think Andres is the best deal maker on the JSE. Um, he, he's done he's done a number of them. Uh, two or one, they've worked in absolute uh, charm. Of course, his his iron ore was just he, he couldn't have timed it better if he tried. Iron ore's come down. They're still doing great there. Uh, potential for 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 magnesium um yeah you know, they started as they were aggregates right they were basically just selling crushed rock when they listed back in was i think 2007 uh and and fundamentally transformed the the, the company and and been a huge success one of the the few of that altex uh, boom from sort of 2006 2007 well here's a great stat i i love statistics i put something up on my twitter page about a month ago and uh, if you would have asked me or asked anybody what was the best performing share in the JSE over the last 10 years, you probably would have probably guessed NASPERS. You would have been wrong. It was Acrimat. Acrimat was up 1,850%, and, Nas and NASPERS was up 1,400%. So there it, there it is, a little company from a small office in Tiger Valley, where basically they, they run on a very lean, mean budget, run by possibly one of the best CEOs in the mid-cap space where I've come across. Andres van Heden and his have turned a 
small aggregates company selling and crushed rock for building roads to now a, a, a multi-dimensional uh, mining resources based company with legs into supplying products not just for the construction sector but into the steel industry the glass industry the agricultural sector and as you rightly said earlier they've now moved into iron ore coal and soon to be manganese and with an eight billion rand company there's still legs to come and again they've been master deal makers and i remember their transactions uh, very 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 well i've covered the company since inception i had my first buy in the stock at three rand 15 when the share price completely crashed after the listing because the world cup came along nobody was building anything oh, yeah, and yeah. the share price crashed it, it kept its powder dry and didn't buy anything and waited for everybody else to go bust and then they bought great assets cheaply and i'll give you one example as to an early deal they bought from exaro the giant mining company um called uh, glenn douglas yeah. Now, dolomite is a rock used in the steel making industry it's a key component so Xaro sold this thing off because it didn't want to be in it. So Afrimat paid 35 million rand for this business. Xaro couldn't care less. It was an insignificant part of their empire. Afrimat goes in, they restructure the operations, they cut costs, they put in far more efficient um, machinery and, and mining and, uh, uh, and sales practices. Within five years, that, that business was making 35 million rand a year. The other example is, I think about five years ago, out of liquidation, they bought an iron ore mine near Sishan called Demaneng, yeah. which had a very short mine of life, but the potential for big reserves. They bought it, they put in uh, CapEx, and they restructured the mine. All in all, they paid 400 million rand for their entry into iron ore. In the last set of results, Demaneng made a billion rand in profit, showing you that if you buy the right asset at the right time, and you're experts in mining a product efficiently. And if you catch the right wave, which iron ore was actually in a great wave, you can make a great deal of money for producing iron ore is circa $60 a ton. So even though, even though iron ore is off from $220 a ton at its peak in late July, it fell to $94, it's now back to about $125 yeah. round numbers. They're still making far more margin than they ever would selling gravel and crushed rock into roads. And the same for manganese. So whilst, whilst in the short term, there may be a bit of an earnings blip because the really super profits, or as I called it, obscene profits we were making from iron ore have, have not stopped. They're still making fantastic profits. It's just not obscene. Um, Afrimat, with a little bit of a pullback, is looking very attractive, but I still think it'll, it'll attract back a bit more because the rhetoric coming out of China regarding cleaning up the environment, yeah. doing away with dirty, uh, coal-blasting steel furnace going. And that may impact the iron ore market and steel production. You can see it in the daily and weekly stats from China. So the iron ore market is still a little bit sort of uh, uh, sensitive. Uh, it's a bit like the tech market, which hit NASPERS, Alibaba, DD, et cetera, et cetera. So let the Chinese calm down. Um, they're doing all of this because in February 2022, it's the Winter Olympics in Beijing. And if anybody remembers the, tw uh, the, the last uh, Summer Olympics in Beijing in, 20, in 2008, Apart from a fantastic bird's nest stadium and the fantastic fireworks, there was terrible pollution, which hampered the athletes' performance, and they complained. So this amazing country, which was showcasing a world, its development, was blighted by smog and pollution. They said that's not happening again. So they've told their dirty industries, you will clean up ahead of the Olympics or else, which is why there's been this huge cleanup and this greening of, of China, which has hit the power market, and the iron ore market. When it calms down, things will be a lot better. But Afrimat to me remains a fantastic business with one currently in a holding pattern. And you, you make a great point. I mean, Afrimat and, and Anderson Yedden, he's sort of in the in the mold of of, of Jeb McIntosh from from Combined Motor. And you can imagine, I mean, Andreas is going to be there forever. But you you made it, it slipped in a small thing there. A lot of these small little companies with really great management teams and great performance, they operate out of what would be considered politely B grade offices. They don't have the fancy office at the VNA or you know in, in, in Santon or something like that. I mean ARB, I mean I, I'm convinced that Billy basically uses a, a storeroom at, at the back of his warehouse. Can I tell you uh, when you cover companies as long as I have, the thing that gives you confidence in a company is when you go to the head office and it looks like you've you've stepped back into a 1950s um, uh, office. 
So the number of companies that I go into, and I, and I, I made a remark once, and Andreas Van Heden uh, actually told me about it when I made the comment about his head office in Tiger Valley. I said it looked like a porter cabin, but it had been left outside in the rain. <laughs> so he spent a bit of money doing it up. But they don't need fancy offices. Yeah. It's a bit like New World in, uh, in Johannesburg. The offices haven't changed in 30 years. Yes. You mentioned ARB Holdings. Uh, Bola Metcalf's offices here yeah. in, uh, in Ottery in Cape Town have not changed since 1996. They still have the same paintings on the wall, the same coverings on the chairs. You don't need to spend money on lavish head offices and fancy paintings and, and luxury furnishings to actually impress anybody. You just run the business well. And the differentiating factor in most of these cases is owner-operated companies, where it's their money, their business, and it's their, it's their profits that are going on fancy offices. They don't want that. So if you ever walk into a company and you look and it looks like the, the carpets are, are, are threadbare and the, the furniture looks like it's falling apart, that's probably a great business to, to invest in because they know how to allocate and look after capital. Yeah, and at that point, it's their money. I mean, it's the shareholder money. They're a shareholder. Really, carpets are carpets. You don't need mm -hmm. to have them fancy. Let, let's change tack a little bit um, into, into some where there's some interesting activity happening. York Timbers, forever and a day, this has been a company that's traded at significant discounts in its asset value. I know a lot of folks have, have got excited about it. it it's never really delivered. Well, it did way back, what, about 12, 15, so there we go, you can see that spike back in 2007. Um, suddenly activity happening and, and partly being, being driven, and you can't see it because it's, it's, let me zoom that in a bit so we lose some of that, but certainly, suddenly uh, York Timber's finding a bit of life. We got uh, 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 2A, was it A2, uh, coming in and perhaps spicing it up there. Yeah, this has been a fantastic story. Um, I've been covering York Timbers for many, many years, and York Timbers, for anyone out there, uh, many years ago, uh, if you were going to a supermarket and you wanted to buy clothes pegs or an ironing board or a, or a clothes dryer, it was usually made by York Timbers. And that was what we were known for. When, it, when Solly Tucker used to run my business, I'm going back now 30 years. Yeah. So I really am showing my, my, mm -hmm. my gray hair. But that's, that chart that you showed there showed a, a, major, a major spike to about uh, 20 rand a share when they did a deal funded by private equity to buy a company called Global Forestry Products. And they issued a, uh, they, issued, they took on too much debt, then they had to have an emergency rights issue and the share price completely crashed. And for 10 years, uh, the company went basically nowhere. Um, for 10 years, they didn't pay a dividend. For 10 years, there was no consistency in earnings. For 10 years, uh, the market was disappointed. But in the same period, management happily lined their own pockets. Yeah. So I wrote a note on this a while back saying in the 10 years, where, where shareholders got zero. Management paid themselves 150 million rand in performance bonuses and fees. <laughs> and I thought that was an absolute disgrace. So that chart you see there, where it basically goes sideways in about the 170, 180 level, um, a very unfortunate event occurred, uh, which can sometimes catalyze a, a company share price. And I, I don't mean to, to denigrate what happened, but it, it gives you an example of, of how mm. a change in, in a company can lead to an event. Sadly, the former CEO of York Timbers, uh, Pete Pansel, passed away of COVID in late June, early July. So the company was in a bit of a vacuum. Um, the private equity player, um, uh, Laraco Metier, who funded the transaction, which took the share price to 20 Rand, and then crashed back to two Rand, had lost an untold fortune of money. Uh, they just wanted out. They'd been there forever and a day, and they just wanted out and a new investment vehicle called A2 Investment Partners, founded by a former Coronation Asset Manager called Adrian Zettler, an industry executive called Andre von der Vien, uh, who's been at HCI, KWV, Nivius, amongst others, created this investment vehicle to become activist shareholders in companies where they believed there was a significant value unlock from a, from a huge discount to net asset value. So about one rand 75, one rand 80, they bought all of Laraco Metier's stake of 16%, and they started um, what I would call shaking the tree, to use a wonderful metaphor. Um, they rallied support from institutional shareholders who were fed up of 10 years of rubbish performance, and they basically got uh, over 50% of the shareholders on their side. They then approached management saying, hey, we are now your single largest individual shareholder, and all of the minority and major institutional shareholders are our friends. We want two seats on the board, and we think this company needs to be run better, uh, get better returns, 
and actually start unlocking this nine rand 20 net asset value yeah. when you're trading basically at two rand. There was a bit of a fight between the, the, the old crusty board and uh, an A2, but A2 won because at the end of the day, they had the votes on their side. So again, I'm just showing to you how a narrative can change where an opportunity was, was seen regarding the, the unfortunate passing of a CEO in a vacuum in a company that had been underperforming but had the potential to become a really profitable entity. And that share price went from one grand 75 to high of 390. We're now back to about three grand 50. In the next month, there is the AGM coming up where I expect potential board changes to occur and a new CEO. Now, a new CEO coming in would change the strategy and the vision of a company and would try and unlock further value and further operational efficiency from a company which has not been well run for a decade. I coined the term of York Timbers, based there in Sabi, was run like a little fiefdom, a little kingdom. And they ran that little town the way that they wanted. But the trouble is, it's owned by shareholders. Yeah. Shareholders want earnings and they want dividends. They do not want a little fiefdom. So I'm saying that York Tim was at three Rand 50 with a net asset value north of nine Rand and significant operational leverage yet to come from a leaner, meaner, uh, more profitable entity down the track still, in my mind, remains highly attractive as, a, as an activist play in this sector. Let, let's change tack a little bit. Agriculture, you, you mentioned it earlier, obviously via Omni. Uh, uh, you've been tweeting around Zeta, who about a year ago promised us some value unlock. And with respect to Zeta, there's been a bit. They sold quantum. They've given some cash back and the like. But we, we've got a – it's actually relatively small. We've got Carpark. We've also got some stocks uh, listed on, on, on other exchanges as opposed uh, to the to the JSC and the Agri. And Agri is one of the spaces which you, you, you cover as a, as a broad sector. Yes, I must say, uh, I don't think any other food analyst in this country covers the sector, um, which is a shame. Because whilst many companies are unlisted, they're either over the counter or on alternative exchanges, they are, they, are, they are immensely large profitable entities. I'll give you an example. Um, Senves, based in Clarksdorp um, in the Northwest, is a grains titan. Uh, it, has, it has a multi-billion rand revenue and makes half a billion rand a year in profit and sits at a net asset value of about 17 rand 50 and is trading at 11 rand 40. It's one of the biggest companies no one's ever heard of, but it's been in this country for 100 years. If Senders didn't exist, uh, you would not have a grain on, on your table. Yeah. Um, I was involved in the listing uh, about a month ago of an Mpumalanga-based agricultural business called TWK. Yeah. Uh, that's an acronym for Transvala Wattle Company, uh, founded in 1946 to sell wattle uh, into the export market, which is used to make uh, wood chips and, and paper. Um, they're now an 8 billion rand a year revenue company, making, again, about 400 million rand, trading at a discount net asset value. Uh, and it's surprising how many of these multi-billion rand businesses are out there, which no one's ever heard of. And my favorite story uh, is a company called Subtropico. It's unlisted, but you can trade the shares on the over-the-counter market. They have a, a very unassuming office in Halsfontein in Pretoria. It's above a shopping center, but it looks like it's seen better days. You walk in and it's a typical office that hasn't changed probably since the since the World War One. But the, the, the Kruger family that run this empire, which is a former banana marketing board, and are, are now a five billion rand a year meat business. They have a larger supplies of bananas to Woolworths. They have a larger supplies of cut fruit and, and vegetables into all the supermarket chains. And they have an annual turnover of 10 billion rand. And it's a family owned business. And I think, you know, your listeners out there will be surprised how many major agriculture and food businesses are family owned, hidden away in the doorbells, which at some point may list. And I cover them all because at some point they do list and there's significant value. And to come back to your point, Carp Agri was one of those stocks. I've been covering Carp Agri for nearly 20 years. It's one of my large personal shareholdings and it's one of those stocks where I can confidently say I will never sell. I will never sell Carp Agri until the day that I, I, I meet my mortal maker. Um, fantastic agricultural business um, in the Western Cape, nationwide footprint, predominantly in retail. So I nicknamed them many years ago the Burra Masmat. So it's basically like Masmat, but yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's Afrikaans. Uh, they have a very large agricultural division, and they also service the, re the retail market. 
And you're going to bought the stock way back in the day for 31 cents. It lifted. It got to a high of 64 rand. It got to a low of about 20 rand. And we're now back to about 45 rand. And I'm expecting big things from Carp Agri in the next 12 months. It's a September year end. I'm forecasting earnings of maybe four rand 80 a share, which will bring the PE down to probably about an eight. It's got a great dividend yield. They've just sold the property division to, to release yeah. money to become an owner operator of their fuel sites. You don't, you don't have to own the house to actually live in it. And I think that Carp Agri, in my mind, is poised at some stage for a breakout and I have a target value of between 54 and 65 rand. Again, it's a three billion rand business with a near 10 billion rand company sitting here in the Western Cape, which hardly anybody's heard about, but is listed on the JSE. But many years ago, it was over the counter trading for peanuts. Yeah, and that deal they did with the land, I, I take your point on it. Don't own the land, sell it, lease it back, free up the cash, you know, do something with, yep. with, with the cash. And, and another one of those, those, those smart ones. It's slightly, I mean, what about the, the challenges? And we've been seeing it, and this is obviously particularly a lot more in, in the coal and, and, and sort of the, 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 you know, the iron ore, I suppose, as well. Uh, and I sort of, there was issues at Soldana as well. The whole uh, 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 Transnet, Portnet infrastructure, and, and you're making the point that actually this could be good for some for some companies with, with considering those 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 challenges with Portnet and Transnet. Uh, you, you're raising a subject which is currently very dear to my heart. Now I'm an old-fashioned analyst. Anyone that knows me knows that I hate technology, uh, even though I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an electrical engineer by by training. I love writing things in old-fashioned fountain pen, and I'm a, I'm a compulsive keeper of notes with yes, these little manila files. But this one notes. there says rail. <laughs> Yeah, that says rail. Now, if I start a file, it means I've started a file for a reason. And right now, I had a conversation with a number of clients for the last week and a half. If I were to start investing money right now for the next, what I call the next big story uh, in the small to mid cap space, it would be in transport and logistics and specifically rail and ports. Now, why do I say that? The answer is extremely simple. We as listeners, know that this country, country is going through turmoil. Uh, we have a, a, a paralyzed government. We have a number of, of, of government owned enterprises like SAA, Portnet, Transnet, Danel. The list is endless, ESCOM, which are basically failing to deliver the services that we as a consumer and the economy needs to, to generate the taxation revenue to keep this country going. Transnet as a monopoly provider of rail services basically has badly let down the mining industry. We are now in an unprecedented commodity boom in this country where coal, iron ore, manganese, ferrochrome, platinum, you name it, is in global demand. The trouble is the railway network has collapsed so extensively that many large companies in the last few months, Exaro, Cumba, African Rainbow Minerals, Afrimax, amongst others, have complained they simply cannot get their product to port which means they can't raise revenue, and that revenue cannot make profit to pay taxes. And I love statistics. There was a statistic out last week which was given to me that there are 50 billion rand worth of commodities sitting in stockpiles around the country which cannot be moved to port because of a transnet issue. The taxation on that is 9.6 billion rand, which could easily flow to the exchequer if transnet would allow private enterprise to use their own locomotives to transport the stuff to Saldana, Port Elizabeth, or Durban. What I'm alluding to in, in a discussion uh, with you now, which I've been working on very quietly for the last few weeks, is I believe that in the coming fortnight, even the next month, that Transnet will probably open up um, its railway network into a public-private partnership, which will allow private companies to contract with major private enterprise to move coal, iron ore and other commodities from point A to the ports. They would pay Transnet a fee, and I think the private companies would, be ha would happily pay a premium for a liable service. And I'll give you a direct example. Yesterday, uh, Tungela Coal, which has done fantastically well, said that 17 million tons of coal cannot be exported from their, from their operations because of rail inefficiencies. They will, they will, they will negate uh, a huge slump in revenue so if we could ship the stuff, we could make the money. So if a private enterprise can ship this coal, everybody wins. So where's the angle here? The angle is companies 
which have expertise in rail and port logistics, who have got the kit on the ground, who have got money and or expertise. So let me throw out a few names to you. A big enterprise is Bidvest. I don't cover Bidvest oh. because it's too big, but, yeah. they, but they have money and they had expertise in logistics and they want to move into the ports. They could easily buy somebody to get exposure to what could be a PPP uh, with Transnet, which could be a, a very lucrative new endeavor in the logistics space for years to come. Because we know as a country that Transnet and Portnet are not going to be fixed overnight unless there is private enterprise helping them out. Another player, which I think will do extremely well, is Grinrod. Yeah. Now, Grinrod actually has locomotives. It's got 57 locomotives. It actually has an operating system. So if, if Transnet were to suddenly say, private enterprise, we will allow you to use our tracks to move bulk commodities around the country, to generate revenue and generate taxation revenue, but you must give us a fee for using our network. It's a bit like toll roads. Um, if that is actually approved, um, I, will, I will have a side bet with you right now, but companies like Grinrod and Bidvest and others in the, in, the, in the private space do extremely well. And Grinrod been, has been ticking up quite nicely the last few weeks in anticipation of this rail um, uh, liberalization. There is a policy called ARIA, E-R-R-P. I've been writing about this for the last month or so. It's basically a, a, a policy uh, forum where private enterprise can use government infrastructure to benefit the economy, to generate revenue for private companies and taxation revenue for the government. It's, it's the holy grail of this economy because we have operated as, as, a, as a semi, what I would call a star in the state. It's a central command economy. Yeah. We need public enterprise to fix ESCOM, to fix uh, SAA, to fix Portnet, to fix Transnet. And if they do that, the country benefits. The first test could be Transnet and Portnet. And I think an announcement is coming within the next month. And if an announcement does come, I think the real money to be made in the next few years in this country will be from private enterprise using government infrastructure to help out private industry. And a lot of money will be made. And that's why I'm building a little file. And I do not build a file for the sake of my health. I do it because there's money to be made. Not today, not tomorrow, but it's the, it's the next big idea that I have for the next probably five or 10 years in this country. PPPs. Yeah. Let's see if I'm right. And I mean, I was listening to Jalan Glovo from, from, from Gala Resources. Their problem is not just to stockpile. They run out of space to stockpile next month, which means... They, I mean, I don't know what they do. I mean, I, you know, they would gladly pay, they'll pay a premium just to get the stuff out and, and get those great prices that are going to happen. And let's, let's wrap this up. We're starting to bunch onto time. We started up right up front, 2021. And in fact, even last year was, was you know, notwithstanding, we started, we collapsed with the pandemic. It's been a, a great year for the, the small and mid-cap space, way outperforming the the the, the, the big heavyweights, the NAS passes and, and the like. What's your look if you look into... 2022 and, and throw it into next year? Well, uh, Simon, a lot of the easy money has been made. You know, if you cover the sector as long as I have, you know, when the stocks were really bombed out a year and a half ago, uh, they were being given away. In many cases, you were buying the company at, their, at, the, at basically their cash value. And, I, and I've named, for example, Combined Motor Holdings, which you could have bought back at the height of a, of a pandemic. Basically, you could have bought the company for nothing because the cash was worth the entire market cap. As it stands right now, even though there's been an enormous re-rating of the small to mid-cap sector, many have produced extremely good results. So the price earnings ratio is still, I think, relatively attractive on a, on a one or two year view. You know, the likes of an Argent Industrial, uh, a CAP, um, an Invicta, an Acrimat, amongst others, still have significant legs in the earnings potential. So even though a lot of easy money has been made, but you're only recovering from what was a really bombed out scenario. So you're now back to what I would call near normality. And because the market has, has basically given up on the small to mid cap, uh, re, uh, cover, sorry, uh, they've given up on covering the small to mid cap sector, many of the larger institutions are, are now playing catch up. So back in the day when, when we were a lot younger, there were a plethora of small to mid cap funds listed yeah. mm. in the unit trust sector. Now there are, now there are a handful. And but there's still a lot of interest from uh, you know the boutique funds, the hedge funds, and the private client market. So I think that as you know, greater transparency, 
and an ongoing delivery of results comes from these companies in what I call a post-pandemic recovery and a return to normalization. We're now in level one. And at some point, hopefully we'll be at level zero and the vaccination rates will go up and the economy will start to turn. If a government suddenly realizes they need to start priming the pumps to get the economy going, to grow taxation revenue, uh, to actually create employment, et cetera, et cetera, something has to give. You know, I'm ever hopeful that at some point this economy will start firing. When that'll be, who knows? But the private industry out there is ready, willing, and able to assist. And there are many small to mid-cap companies out there who are doing very nicely, thank you, filling the gap which is currently being created by government. And I'll give you one classic example. If state schools are full and you aren't getting a great education for your children from state schools, what happens? You have a growth in private education. If a government hospitals can't cope with your needs, what happens? You get private hospitals. Um, if a police can't assist you, what happens? You get private security. You know, if a government can't move you around by SAA, you get Comair, Safair, ULIFT, et cetera, et cetera. The same is true in logistics and ports. You know, I heard a great little story today about Musk, uh, the international shipping giant, is apparently in negotiations to buy the Durban port or operate the Durban port with Transnet. Now, if one of the world's largest shipping and logistics companies suddenly says, you know what? We put in the might of our global wealth into resurrecting Durban port, which is a main gateway of goods into this country. Can you imagine what that will do to sentiment if we can actually export and import? So what I'm saying is, even though a lot of the easy money has been made, there's still plenty of good stories out there waiting to actually emerge. And even the good companies still have legs. Yeah, and it comes back to what we said right up front, where, you know, ironically, during this pandemic, many of these companies and I've, have actually come out stronger because they've got rid of some of those little businesses which weren't quite important. They've they've cut the costs processes down. They, they, they've done some you know, clever bolt-on acquisitions. They've, you know, in the case of of, for example, and Victor Omnia getting rid of some businesses, they're better than they were two or three years ago. Uh, yes, so the easy money might be missing. That doesn't mean that there's nothing left on the table for the next, I don't know, one, three, five years into the future. Absolutely. I, I think right now, um, if I was asked to construct a portfolio of stocks, you know, for the next three years, I could easily select five or six stocks, which I think will absolutely outperform the broader market. Um, it's just a question of, of having the knowledge and the underlying depth of coverage to, uh, to identify those. So I urge the listeners out there, do your research, do your reading. And just because you don't have resources of the, uh, the big institutional asset managers, it doesn't mean that you can get one up on them. In many cases, you can. You just have to be smarter, nimbler, and act quicker. And I've hopefully in the last hour with Simon relayed to you many stories like Afrimat, York Timber, Omnia, uh, Invicta, that uh, have caught the imagination and you could have got in at the very, very start of the runs. You don't have to be that clever. Trust me, I know. I have a, I've made a career from not being that clever. Yeah, yeah. No, clever, not important. And, and you know what? And, and I, I, I don't think I've ever caught the beginning of a run. I'm always Johnny come lately, but that's fine. There's enough run there. There's enough for everyone. We're going to park it there, folks. I know there were some questions that we haven't got to. Uh, Anthony is on Twitter. Go give him a follow. He's nice. He's opinionated. He says things. He puts his head in a block, which is what we always want from the folks on Twitter. Anthony, hugely appreciate your time this evening. Uh, always well worth uh, an hour listening to your, your insights. Uh, I have no doubt that we've gleamed a huge amount. Uh, ladies and gents, everybody else, uh, stay safe. Have a good evening further. Thank you, Simon. It's been a delight. And uh, to all the listeners, have a great evening.